All right, folks, in a second, we're going to bring you some breaking news out of Iraq, and then we're going to talk about it with the director. They have crossed a mountain on foot in the desert heat, forced to flee their homes, driven by their fear of ISIS. This woman says militants beheaded several men in her village and mounted their heads on the hoods of cars. ISIS is well armed, but sheer terror may be their most powerful weapon. All right, folks, um, we have breaking news uh, out of Iraq. Uh, right now embattled Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki has agreed to step down and uh, step aside and he has supported uh, his nominated replacement to the post. Now this is something that the United States has been urging and uh, there were all kinds of reports that uh, he uh, was refusing to do so. In fact at one point a couple of days ago that he was amassing troops around Baghdad and it was going to be a problem. But again, the breaking news uh, just a moments ago uh, is that uh, Nouri al-Maliki has agreed to step aside. And if he follows through, this would end a, a political uh, deadlock uh, that um, put a lot of uncertainty around, around uh, Baghdad. And, uh, and, and many other parts of the country. Joining us now, as I mentioned, is Frederick Kagan, director of the Critical Threats Project at the American Enterprise Institute and one of the intellectual architects of the uh, successful surge strategy in Iraq. And uh, Frederick, welcome back, sir. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, Frederick, uh, uh, what, what's your take on, uh, on the fact that uh, Maliki has uh, reportedly agreed uh, has finally done that, but I think that it would be a mistake to imagine that this is uh, a panacea or uh, something that's going to turn the situation around by itself. What 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 uh, benefits will it have, and and what limitations will it have, do you, as you see it? Well, Maliki was definitely a significant part of the problem, and he had been pursuing a highly sectarian agenda, and he had definitely alienated the Iraqi Sunni population in a way that made them much more vulnerable to the ISIS uh, attacks. Um, the problem is that the alienation, is, the alienation is pretty deep at this point, and the Sunni demands went well beyond uh, having Maliki go, in addition to which ISIS has consolidated control over a significant part of the country, um, which includes m military control. And so this is not just a question of coming to a political settlement now. Their ISIS army is going to have to be defeated in the field and uh, that's something that we really need to be taking much more seriously than we have been, in my opinion. All right. You, you heard the president, or, or uh, maybe not, but hopefully you did, the president talking today, uh, focusing on the uh, humanitarian effort at the, uh, at the mountain and saying that uh, Mount uh, 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 Sinjar, uh, it's been vastly uh, successful and, and uh, that they may be able to, uh, to you know, start to... Uh, I guess leading from behind. It's interesting that there have been much more direct statements from the Australian Prime Minister and from the British Parliament about the need to become militarily engaged in this than we've seen from the White House. So I think it's fair to say that there is a lot more uh, energy in the world for doing something about this than the White House is yet manifesting, which would suggest that it might be possible if we actually had some American leadership for a change uh, to put together a coalition that would be serious about this. Um, from the standpoint of the regional countries, there is the question of whether we think it's a good idea to try to have the Neo-Ottoman Empire and the Neo-Safavid Empire, you know, the Persians, uh, sort of duking it out with this, you know, Al-Qaeda group in Arab lands and the likelihood of that. Uh, you know, ultimately that this is a political situation, that uh, Iraq has to come together politically as if, as if ISIS has any interest or cares about any political setup in Iraq whatsoever. Right. And the other thing about that, that statement that I find particularly troublesome is that it implies that the United States doesn't actually have any significant interests here. Because if you say this is an Iraqi problem, and we basically, we have to let the Iraqis solve it or, and the implication is if they don't, then there's nothing we can do. The corollary to that is that it isn't our problem and that it won't become our problem. And basically that it's okay, and I'm going back to what I said before, that is basically the statement of a policy that says we are okay with having an al-Qaeda state in Iraq and Syria. And if that's where the president actually is, I think it would be great for him to say that and let us have a debate about it. 
So what would you, if you were in the administration or, or an administration, let's not say it was this administration because you, you probably know that, uh, you know, your, your advice would fall on deaf ears and you might tweak your, your strategy to the lower end of, uh, of effectiveness, uh, maybe not, but uh, let's say you were, you were in a, a friendly administration, friendly to you and friendly to your mindset. What would you advise um, a, a president at this point to do? Well, let me start by making a backward-looking observation briefly and then a answer your question directly. The backward-looking observation is I would have advised him not to do exactly what he just did, which is to drop two bombs at a time on ISIS formations in a way that tells ISIS that it needs to go to ground and stop presenting us with lucrative targets that we can hit from the air. And instead of that, once you make the decision that you're going to drop any bombs, he should have gone in and conducted a large-scale campaign against all the fixed targets that we had for ISIS that we've now lost. So we are actually in a significantly worse position now from the standpoint of being able to do damage to this group from the air than we were before he started this, this air, whatever, I won't even call it. The priority is getting in to talk with the Sunni tribes because they are the ones who are going to decide at the end of the day whether ISIS has ground that it can operate on or whether it is going to face a continued uprising by people who don't agree with its ideology. The only way to do that is to go there and talk to them. And that means that American soldiers, by which I mean mainly special forces guys, maybe some covert operatives from other agencies, are going to have to, dare I say it, put boots on the ground and go there and talk to the tribes, find out what their actual demands are, find out what they're prepared to do, and find out what they need from us in order to help fight these guys. Now, that may not be good enough. It may not work. But it's the best chance that we have to try to figure out how to prevent this al-Qaeda state from establishing itself in a way that will be very hard to remove without actually having to go in with massive conventional U.S. military power, which nobody wants to do. Right. Got one more for you. We have about a minute and a half left. And doing it, he brags that he did, that he's done it. And when he was asked Saturday if he regretted taking all the troops out, he said, "You know, I'm, I'm amazed you asked this question as if I, I, as if I did it. I didn't do it. You know, it was a previous administration. What, what, what do you think when you hear that?" Well, I, I you know, I, I don't, I don't want to get into relitigating all of this stuff. Let me just say, if in fact it is the case that this administration tried to get an extension of the agreement, which it did, and failed to, then it was a massive failure of diplomacy. And I think for an administration that has touted itself for its smart power, its inability to make diplomatic breakthroughs on many, many, many issues, to me, doesn't disprove the value of smart power, but it does call into question the ability of this administration to conduct even what it said it was going to be best at. And I think this is a classic example. Great, great point, Frederick. Great point. Thank you, sir. I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot. Frederick Kagan, ladies and gentlemen, director of the Critical Threats Project at the American Enterprise Institute, one of the intellectual architects of the uh, surge strategy in Iraq, which was very successful. All right, folks, uh, we're going to be talking to a former U.S. Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez when we come back. And it's going to involve this. And so this poll question is very relevant. Let me ask you, do you believe that the children of illegals should be deported or educated? Now, I assume we're talking about the kids who crossed the border and came here without parents. Uh, go to New...